In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear faithful, my dear first communicants, in the early ages of the Church, it was a custom, long time ago, to give to little children the consecrated particles which remained after the communion of the faithful. One day, a young boy, the son of a Jew, went with his Christian friends to the church in order to receive these particles. He did it in good faith. He did it without a bad intention. He did it innocently. When he returned home, he told his father what he has done. And the father, being a very brutal man, filled with hatred towards the Christian religion, took his son and threw him into a burning oven. Afterwards, the mother returned and she was looking for her son, but she could not find him. She looked in the whole city. It was the city of Constantinople, which was huge. It was an important, time, important town at this time, but nobody could help her. She was looking for him for three days. And after three days, she was so sad that she started to say his name. And all of a sudden, she heard his voice coming out from the oven. She was very surprised. And they knew she heard his voice. And she went to the oven, opened it, and what a surprise, her son was there. He survived. The boy was taken out and asked how he had managed to fall into the oven. He told them that it had been his father, but that a tall lady appeared dazzling with light, and she protected him with his mantle and gave him food to eat. He described her as the lady on the images that he had seen in the Christian church. Everybody knew that it was Our Lady. After this wonderful miracle, the father of the boy was severely punished by the emperor, but the boy and his mother converted and became fervent Christians. My dear friends, maybe this boy had your age when this miracle happened. And this example shows you that there are only two things that will preserve you from the dangers of this world, the Holy Eucharist and Our Lady. And since we have the joy to assist at your First Holy Communion today, I want to speak about the Blessed Sacrament, first about this institution, then we will speak about the fruitful Holy Communion, and at the end we will look at Our Lady of the Blessed Sacrament. Let us think about the question whether the institution of this sacrament was fitting. St. Thomas Aquinas, doctor of the church and patron of a religious community, gives us three reasons for this. Because it contains Christ himself, we need the presence of our friends. And charity is the love, is the love of friendship, and therefore we need his presence. How sad would be our life without his presence? The second reason is because without faith in his passion, no one can be saved. Hence, it is most fitting that man have something that represents his passion. In the Old Testament, it was the Paschal Lamb. In the New Testament, it's the Holy Eucharist. And the third reason, because the last words of a person are the most memorable and they kindle in a special manner the affections of friends. When a father or mother must die, he wants to give some last words to his children. But he has a hard time to do so. It's difficult to find the right words. And he, knew, he knows that he cannot change the situation. He must die. Our Lord, however, did not only find most expressive words of his love, but he found words which express, which affect what they signify. The words of consecration, which are repeated during each 
each Mass? With which emotions has been filled the Sacred Heart of Jesus? On the one hand, there was his justice, his wisdom, his majesty, his sanctity. And for these attributes, humanly speaking, the abasement of the Holy Eucharist, this veiled state, is repugnant. But on the other hand, there was his ardent desire to remain with us. And for sure in our Lord, there was no contradiction. So all these attributes were reconciled in his sacred heart. They were immersed in this infinite ocean of love. And the result was the most wonderful mystery of our faith, the most consoling reality of our life, and the center of Catholic worship, the Holy Eucharist. Let us speak now about the fruitful reception of Holy Communion. Why do so many souls after frequent communions make so little progress in sanctity? The fault is not in the food, but in him who takes it without proper dispositions. So what should be done before communion? First, have a lively faith. Say to yourself, I will receive our Lord. I will receive his body, blood, soul, and divinity. How happy would we be if we knew that Our Lady would appear to us with her divine child? But communion is a greater miracle because you are most closely united to our Lord and you believe it by the certitude of faith, which is based on the authority of God revealing. Faith is very pleasing to our Lord. When he was on earth, he was praising those who had faith in him. Pure faith, unwavering faith, faith which is based on the authority of God revealing and not on feelings. In a second point, humble yourself. After having reminded yourself that it is Jesus Christ whom you are about to receive, you will receive God. Remember the words of St. Alphonsus who said, only a God is worthy to receive God. We are but miserable and sinful creatures, but Almighty God has a desire to be united to us. Let us therefore regret our sins Think about our nothingness, and then say with the words of Psalm 41, Deep calleth on deep at the noise of thy floodgates, which means the abyss of our misery calls the abyss of God's merciful love in the noise of the streams of graces which flow from the Eucharistic heart of Jesus. In a third point, recall to your mind the sufferings of our Lord, and meditate, it means think about it for at least some instances, especially on the fact that he suffered for each of us. Truly, we can say with St. Paul, he has loved me and given himself up to death for me. Everybody can say, he became incarnate for me. He prayed for me. He fasted for me. He suffered and died for me. He instituted the Holy Eucharist for me. And now we understand better why St. Paul exclaimed, the charity of Christ presseth us. The charity of Christ presseth us. And this leads us to the fourth point of preparation. Think about his love and love him. Our Lord loves you, love him in return. Speak with him about his love. Thank him for his love. Thank him for the whole work of redemption. Thank him for the Holy Eucharist. Thank him for Holy Communion. Thank him for his personal love that he has for you. And then ask our Lord, why? My Lord, do you owe me something? Why do you do this for me? And what is his answer? It is found in the book of Proverbs where it is written, my delights are to be with the children of men. And our true delights the true delights of a Christian life are to be with our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Yes, Jesus in the tabernacle is our God and our all. Inflamed with such sentiments and lofty thoughts, our communions will be certainly fruitful. 
And let us summarize. Faith, humility, consideration of his passion, and love. And this last aspect, love, is the most important and is to be prolonged during our time of thanksgiving, which is the second condition of a fruitful communion. How should we spend our time of thanksgiving after communion? Well, the first time is, the first thing is to provi provide a time of thanksgiving. To run out the church immediately after mass is a sign that no thanksgiving is done. It's a sign that the most wonderful mystery of our faith is neither understood nor loved as it should be. And if we traditional Catholics who have the real presence, who have a real sacramental communion and not a cookie distribution like in the Novus Ordo, if we are not most fervent in our thanksgiving, who else should it be? Protestants, Novus Ordites, Schismatics? What a shame if the last remnant of true Catholics is not most fervent in his Eucharistic devotion. And Pope St. Pius X did not permit daily communion in order to pr produce a lukewarm mediocrity. In his decree on daily communion, he writes, but whereas the sacraments of the new law, though they take effect ex opere operato, which means by themselves, nevertheless these sacraments produce a greater effect in proportion as the dispositions of the recipient are better. Therefore, care is to be taken that Holy Communion be preceded by serious preparation and followed by a suitable thanksgiving according to each one's strength, circumstances, and duties. He speaks about a serious preparation and about a suitable thanksgiving. This was the reason for allowing daily communion. May this deplorable fact of leaving the church without thanksgiving be no longer seen amongst us. But now the question arises, how should I do it? You can repeat all the acts that are described for the preparation. Believe a lot, love a lot, speak with him who is present in your soul now, speak with him with the simplicity of a child, tell him your joys, tell him your anxieties, tell him your maladies. You can use a prayer book for this. St. Teresa tells us, after Holy Communion, our Lord dwells within our soul as it were on a throne of mercy. And one day our Lord said to her, my daughter, ask of me whatever you want. I only entered into you to bestow benefits upon you. Another method of thanksgiving is to do it according to the four ends of sacrifice, which are adoration, thanksgiving, reparation, and petition. Cry out to our Lord for mercy and help. Ask for whatever you want, but especially for spiritual things like progress in prayer life, virtues, and final perseverance. And now I want to say something especially to all children present. Pope Pius XI had great confidence in the power of your prayers and of your communions. He wrote, And you, white legions of children, who are so loved and dear to Jesus when you receive in Holy Communion the bread of life, raise up your simple and innocent prayers and unite them with those of the Universal Church. Pius XI and all true popes trusted in your communions, trusted in your prayers. Pray therefore for Holy Mother Church and for the conversion of this impious world. And now a last practical detail should be mentioned. How long should be our thanksgiving? Usually it is done during 15 minutes. But someone could reply, that's too long, cannot be concentrated. Then start with 10 minutes. If it's too long, take five minutes. With a prayer book, it's certainly possible. And don't forget that our Lord was on earth for you during 33 years. He was on the cross for you during three hours. 
He is in the Blessed Sacrament for you since about 2,000 years, and He waits for you in the tabernacle day and night. Be generous. And the model par excellence of generosity is our Heavenly Mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary. It is not without reason that she is called Our Lady of the Blessed Sacrament, since we receive the body which was formed in her womb. And she teaches us how to, live, how to lead a Eucharistic life. She is here with us. Let us look at, our, at the stained glass window. In her hands, she has a lily, which is, a, which is the sign of purity. Purity of the body, purity of the mind, purity of the tongue, purity of the memory. By this, she teaches us to live a hidden life, a life of silence and solitude, according to the state of our life. With her eyes, she looked towards God, towards heaven, towards God. She teaches us to lead an interior life, a life of prayer. Our eyes are made to look at the Blessed Sacrament. And her last feature is her immaculate heart, which stands for her love. Love was really the motor of her life. And love is like a fire which is enkindled through this wood of sufferings. Sufferings are a sign of predilection. If you suffer a lot, lo God loves you a lot. And if you bear the sufferings for the love of God, they will be the true treasure of your life. And therefore, with her Immaculate Heart, she teaches us a life of sacrifice. And therefore, I repeat, we have her lily. It's a hidden life. Her eyes, which stands for the interior life, and then her heart, which stands for a life of sacrifice. And this is exactly the life, of our, the Eucharistic life of our Lord. And this is given to our imitation. And don't forget to receive always Holy Communion in union with Our Lady. Before Holy Communion, ask her to give you her heart and then adore our Lord through her. And if it's impossible for you to make a single pious thought, if you're completely distracted, then offer your poverty to her and she will do thanksgiving for you. My beloved friends, let us love our Eucharistic Lord. Let us love him through Mary. Let us love him every day, like on the day of our first Holy Communion, with our whole heart, with our whole soul, with our whole mind, and with our whole strength. Let us put the Eucharist in the center of our life, so that the sacred heart of Jesus in the most, most blessed sacrament be praised, adored, and loved with grateful affection at every moment in all the tabernacles of the world, even to the end of time. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.